It's almost the end of March, and we're almost through a quarter of 2022. How are your resolutions coming along? Now, for most of us, we probably had a very ambitious list of things that we wanted to get done this year. And the race is on, and perhaps for most of us, we are still trying to get through it. Yet for some of us, and perhaps many of us, there are also certain things that we've written down this year, certain bad habits that we feel are so self-destructive that we want to get rid of. For example, you know, to stop overeating, to stop overspending, to quit smoking. Yet for many of us, we're still struggling. We're still doing many of these things today, despite the fact that we know that they're actually bad for us. Yet we're not alone because if we look around us, we can also see people seem to be quite addicted to self-destruction and they find it very hard to not self-destruct in many ways. You think about the politician, for example, who had won an election and yet is engaged in so much controversy. Or perhaps that friend that has everything and yet is somehow throwing his life away. And not to mention celebrities that are literally going through meltdowns when they have such a great life. And then we look back to us. There's so many things that we do in life that we know are bad for us, yet we just can't help but stop. Why is it that we can't seem to escape self-destruction? Is it because there's a part of us that's intrinsically sadistic, perhaps? And I thought this would be an interesting topic for us to look at today. Are we addicted? to self-destruction. While we aren't the first people to really think about this, one of the most prolific thinkers to actually tackle this question is the famous macabre writer Edgar Allan Poe. Now, if you know of Poe's work, you'd know he's written all these really amazing stories, especially of a gothic horror sort. And we can tell that this person has a sort of dark vibe about him. But perhaps for many of you who've never heard of Edgar, or for those of you who don't know his personal life, he's had a rather interesting life. For example, he once had to go to Washington DC to try and raise awareness and potentially finances for a magazine and potentially also a government job. But when he actually went there, he got drunk and totally messed up his meetings. He got into a long war with the famous American author, Henry Longfellow, and they would have these heated exchanges, which became known as the Longfellow War. He had horrible relationships with editors, with writers in the literature circles. He was just a complete mess, totally self-destructive. And for most of his life, he was actually doing very badly, never really had any successes. And then finally, when he released one of his most amazing works, The Raven, which became an international sensation and he was invited to talk about this amazing story that he had just written and we finally had the chance to talk about it he completely went off tangent and started talking about another work of his which was not as famous and people were just shocked and they wrote about how strange he was. This was a person that seemed to be on a path of destruction for himself. In fact, famously, before he passed away, he decided to make one of his greatest enemies his actual executor of his will. And again, by all intents and purposes, when you look at his life, you just start to think, what is wrong with this guy? Why is he so set on destroying himself? And to answer that, we can actually get a glimpse of his own philosophy in one of his famous works, The Imp of the Perverse, where he actually talked about this phenomenon called perverseness. And according to Edgar Allan Poe, perverseness is essentially when we feel that something is so wrong that we know in every fibre of our body that it is wrong. There is actually an unconquerable force for us to do those wrong things. There is this perverseness that is very innate in human beings. And that girl and Poe certainly believed in it, at least in the way that he actually lived. He seemed to do everything that was destructive. And what Agel and Poe did, really, I think, is one of the first accounts that we've ever had of a person really looking at why we are so addicted to this self-destruction. But of course, Agel and Poe was not a scientist. He wasn't a psychologist. He didn't have a scientific method of actually look at, looking at it. But he certainly identified this phenomenon that we are talking about today. But eventually psychology would take a look at it. And the first prominent figure to really look at it was actually the father of psychology, Sigmund Freud. Now, according to Freud in his 1919 essay, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, which is a great theory that I've talked about in some of my previous videos, Freud also noticed that people had tendencies to destroy themselves, whether it is an addiction that they had or certain totally irrational behaviors that seemed to lead to very ill consequences for the people. And Freud would come to identify these tendencies as a death drive. Essentially for Freud, this is an innate and unconscious part of us that somehow is driven to our demise 
implies in the almost very literal sense of the word. If we were to really keep engaging in many of these tendencies, whether it is in, for example, overeating, the result is demise. And Freud would actually call this death drive, gave it a very fancy name known as Thanatos, which I think for those of you who are into Marvel movies is where we have the potentially the villain's name Thanos. Thanatos was this death drive, and Freud investigated in Thanatos for many years of his life. But why is it that we have this Thanatos? Why is it that we have this death drive? Well, interestingly, there was actually a very famous exchange where Albert Einstein wrote to Freud, who was of course a prominent figure into the human psyche, and Einstein famously asked Freud, how can we prevent future wars? And apparently Freud said, it is unpreventable. And the reason is, as much as any of us would like to think that we are somehow in control of ourselves and we could live very benevolently, this death drive is in every one of us. And perhaps you could say is an unconscious part of us that wants to return us to an inanimate state one day, which is death itself, and that it will manifest itself in our lives. As much as we like to think that it is an instinct for us to survive and to live, there's a part of us that is also naturally bringing us closer to our demise, as it is also reflected in the way that universe works, a sort of entropy. But Freud would also try and explain that the unconscious drive towards destruction could also be a means for us, as strangely as it sounded, to avoid certain uncomfortable psychological pressures that we might be dealing with. It is actually easier to be destructive for us to escape these uncomfortable psychological situations that we might be experiencing unconsciously. But the point being that it is very much part of us. Now, although Freud had actually confirmed that there was such a perverseness that Edgar Allan Poe had talked about and acknowledged that as being very instinctive and also very innate, it wasn't until the 1950s that psychology really looked into it from an experimental perspective. Because in 1950s, what we had was really a cognitive revolution when psychologists and also neuroscientists would look into our minds and see how it worked. And whilst they identified this self-destructive tendencies that we had, they came to a rather different conclusion than Freud. Rather than see it as being an unconscious instinct that we had that could at most be explained as some sort of unconscious human behavior towards just death itself, they started to really look into why these tendencies happened and how it interacted with our brains. And it was in the 1980s that we finally had a more substantial answer from psychologists Roy Baumeister and Stephen Scher. And what was really interesting is that they identified that self-destructive tendencies were not really so much this abstract manifestation that Freud had talked about, or really indeed some perverse dark nature of human beings as Edgar Allan Poe had identified. Rather, it was actually an issue with our deductive and cognitive reasoning. You see, Baumeister and Scher identified three types of self-destructions that we generally go through. First was really the primary self-destruction. This is indeed destruction that led to self-harm. Second, counterproductive behavior, which was essentially behavior that arises from good intentions, but generally end up being self-destructive. And finally, trade-off, which is essentially when we deductively reason between what sort of behaviors to adopt, weighing in all the risks with a consideration of self-destructive tendencies. Now, if all this sounds a bit complicated, let me explain. Now, imagine if a person were to drunk drive. Primary self-destruction would be if the person intended to drunk drive and literally crash, or intentionally, perhaps he was feeling suicidal. That would be primary self-destruction. Counterproductive behavior would be if a person had some drinks that night and they determined that they were in a fit condition to drive, even though they were actually very intoxicated and they went ahead anyway, disregarding the fact that they might get in trouble, whether it is in an accident or perhaps meet the police, that would be counterproductive behavior. And finally, a trade-off would be where they consider all the risk that are involved. They are fully aware that if they were to drunk drive, they would potentially get into some self-harm. Yet at the same time, they are considering perhaps for some reason they need to get home quickly and they can't wait. So they went ahead anyway. Now, what is very interesting according to psychological research is that primary self-destruction is actually very rare. Most of the times when we see self-destructive behavior, they generally aren't intentional. 
Of course, there are people out there that might be intentionally self-harming themselves, and it is very unfortunate people who might be feeling perhaps suicidal. But generally, in psychological research, most of the self-harm that we see has not actually resulted from primary self-destruction. Rather, most of it actually results from counterproductive behavior. Most of the times when we are engaged in self-destruction, we are completely unaware of the self-destructive potential of our behavior. Or perhaps we are aware of it, but we underwrite it substantially. For example, in the case of overeating, most of the time we aren't thinking about the potential disbenefits of overeating. We don't think about the impact it has on our health. Or if we do think about it, we underwrite it. We focus on the task at hand, saturating ourselves in the pleasures of eating. And according to psychological research, we tend to not be able to weigh the risk of our self-destructive behaviors that well as well. After all, we are human. So if it isn't a completely lack of awareness in our own arithmetic of considering our actions, we are just horrible at it. Rarely do we engage in self-destructive behavior because we intend it to. And indeed, in the research of another psychologist later on, Todd Heatherton, what he discovered was a lot of times when we actually engage in self-destruction, if you were to look at it from a neurological point of view, from the point of view of neuroscience, you would see that oftentimes when self-destruction does happen, it actually has more to do with your prefrontal cortex, that part of your brain that is involved in judgment, planning, problem solving, and self-regulation. So what this goes to show is that as much as we might like to think that there is part of us that is just so drawn to the perverseness of self-destruction, and there is some totally abstract thanatos, death drive instinct in us, modern psychology reveals that self-destruction actually comes from our lack of awareness of these behaviors, and really our underwriting of the impact of these behaviors. So the point being that if you are engaged in some of these self-destructive behaviors, whether they are bad habits or certain things in your life, what psychology might reveal to us is that there's nothing wrong with you per se. You are completely fine. Rather, you might be completely unaware of it. Or that if you are aware of it, you haven't really taken a hard look to really assess the risk and the potential outcomes of many of these behaviors that you engage in. And indeed, really, if we were to look at it from the point of view of behavioral economics, we humans tend to have this inability to have the foresight to really see and map out our lives in reflection to the actions that we're committed to. Now, you might right now still enjoy doing some of the bad things that you do because you've not thought about it or you've underwritten it, but have you actually taken the moment to reflect on the outcomes and the consequences if you were to continue doing these things for the remainder of this year. So are we naturally addicted to self-destruction? Well, an empirical answer would be no. We aren't addicted to it. In many ways, we are just horrible at recognizing it and also giving it a careful consideration.